black girls need less nurturing, less protection, less support, less comfort. The research shows that these beliefs are widely held by adults in the United States. A recent report from the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality finds that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. And black girls aren't alone. We also know from the research that adults view black boys as older, more troublesome, and more likely to be guilty than white boys, starting from as young as age 10. When reports first surfaced of the death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice, who was shot by police while playing in the park with a toy gun, he was repeatedly described in the media not as a child, but as a young man. This phenomenon of viewing black children as miniature adults means they're disciplined more often, suspended more frequently, and punished more harshly, including being more likely to be referred to police and arrested. Adults projecting suspicion and risk onto very young black bodies is a particularly pernicious manifestation of racial inequality in America. Normal childhood behaviors, tantrums and disobedience become a criminal threat when black kids do them. And this age compression increasingly denies black children their childhood and robs them of the freedom of just being kids. So this next discussion on race, childhood, and inequality could not be more timely. And I'm tremendously honored to be here to introduce three really extraordinary guests. We have an opportunity this morning to hear from a multi-generational group of leaders who are considering the crucial function of the arts and culture in shifting race-based narratives that impact the life outcomes of children. We'll also have a chance to hear how their work highlights the role that students and educators are playing in constructing new stories and imagining new modes of visualizing black children. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists now. Robin Bernstein is the Dillon Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Harvard. She's a preeminent cultural historian, prolific scholar, and distinguished educator whose work focuses on theater, performance, and childhood with the goal of producing new knowledge about US cultural history, particularly American formations of race from the 19th century to the present. Her most recent book, Racial Innocence, Performing American Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights, won five awards for its groundbreaking study of the racialized and gendered ideologies that shape, inform, and continue to haunt notions of American childhood. And I should say that Robin's not only a brilliant scholar, she also holds um, a Harvard College professorship in recognition of her distinguished contributions to undergraduate teaching and mentorship. Our second panelist is Naomi Wadler. She's a sixth grade student activist attending George Mason Elementary School in Alexandria, Virginia. On March 14, 2018, one month after the Parkland shooting, she organized a walkout at her school and she added an extra minute to honor Cortland Arrington, a 17-year-old black girl who was shot to death at her Alabama high school just three weeks after Parkland but whose death received very little national media attention. Because of her efforts, Naomi was an invited speaker at the March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C. just a few days later. And her speech highlighted the disproportionate impact of gun violence on girls of color and the lack of media coverage and public outrage about the stories of gun violence involving people who look like her. Naomi has made it her mission to share the stories of black and brown girls that we don't see on the front page and is using her platform to give a voice to those who don't have one. She's received many honors and awards, including the Disruptive Innovation Award at the Tribeca Film Festival 
and it was recognized by Teen Vogue, 21 Under 21. And she said that one day she plans to run the New York Times, <laughs> but for now she's teaching herself the ukulele. <laughs> and you'll notice that we actually have three chairs up here because we have a surprise addition to today's panel. Yara Shahidi is a humanitarian, feminist, social activist, actor, and producer. She recently founded 18 by 18, a voter registration platform that encourages newly eligible voters to register, vote, and give voice to the policy issues that are most important to them. Last September, 18 by 18 hosted the We Vote Next Summit in Los Angeles, bringing together 120 delegates from every state in the District of Columbia, along with other accomplished student leaders, activists, and artists from around the country to amplify the voices, stories, and concerns of first-time voters. Yara is also an outspoken advocate for the importance of education for girls, including founding Yara's Club in partnership with the Young, Young Women's Leadership Network of New York to bring high school students together to discuss social issues and empower youth to defeat poverty through education. So Yara began her acting career at the age of six and is perhaps best known for her role as Zoe on ABC's Blackish and its spin-off Grownish. She also recently made her directorial debut with X, a short film that follows a black child on his walk to school in the morning, showing him physically shifting and evolving to match the expectations and the stereotypes that are projected onto him by the world around him. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dean Gay, for the extraordinary introduction. Thank you, Sarah Lewis, for convening us here today. Thank you to everyone who has made this possible, this extraordinary extended conversation that I am so honored to be a part of. And thank you to my beautiful, wonderful co-panelists, who I'm so excited to be speaking with today. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Me too. <laughs> so I was thinking that we could start by talking a little bit about how you became activists, how you decided that that was something that you wanted to do with your life, how you became people who are thinking very deeply about justice and visuality. How did that happen for each of you? Naomi, we could start with you. So I've always had parents who had very open, honest conversations with me about race. And I knew that when all these tragedies happened, such as um, the riot in Charlottesville, I really wanted to do something about it, but I didn't really know how. And so when the Parkland shooting happened and I saw all of these teenagers and kids really speaking out and speaking up um, about what they believed in, I kind of just followed and along in line, and when I spoke at the March for Our Lives, um, everybody was talking about Parkland and gun violence, but that wasn't really my story, because while I've had some experiences, um, I'm not an inner city kid, and I don't really, it's not, that's not my story, and I wanted to talk about something that I knew about, and something that I have lived, and so I wanted to talk about how gun violence affects black women. <laughs> And for me, I, I similarly come from a family that has always had that conversation in our household. Um, being half black and half Iranian, what I appreciate is that I had a very global perspective from a very young age, and the expectation that we would um, understand and appreciate our cultural heritage as well as extend the same empathies and sympathies that we have for our own communities to other communities. Um, and it, it is very helpful as well to have grandparents on either side who have always been socially engaged um, from my, my papa, who has um, always been in academics, but has been the head of school boards, has um, been the person making space for black students. And so he's the person where I actually take notes when we have conversations. <laughs> um, and, and so that conversation happened um, from the moment I was born and similarly when I started making money from this industry that we're in, my, my family kind of sat me down and they were saying, okay, so you're gonna have three 
kind of pots. You are going to determine what you spend, what you save, and what you donate. But within that meant that even our basic infrastructures of how I view and intake money had everything to do with how I decide to give back and be involved with the greater world around me. And, and so I think a matter of being able to be on a show like Blackish, which inherently had a political kind of leaning to it and talked about what it meant to be a black family, it meant that at the age of 14, I was given opportunities to talk about the state of America on national platforms in which I don't know if that opportunity would have been extended to me otherwise if it wasn't for the nature of that show. And so it was a matter of really just understanding how passionate I was about the world around me and then using that platform to then extend it to topics that weren't necessarily being discussed or directly related to the show. How did you get interested specifically in voter registration? Um, so I'm a nerd and I have, <laughs> but uh, happily one, um, and the one thing about voting that I realized is that it, it's set up like an upper middle class hobby. And so it's <laughs> in that you have to have the time to physically go vote. If you have an hourly job, that is not always your reality. And then there's always, I mean, we've heard about voter disenfranchisement, but then even earlier than that, when you look at voter education, there is a political jargon that's used that's intentionally creates a community of people who actually understand our political system. And for those who are outside of that, then voting in the government is something that happens to you rather than something that happens with you. And so understanding that midterms were coming up, and that's again an election that has not been emphasized, especially amongst my generation, we usually uh, focus on presidential elections, and realizing how integral um, midterms were in setting us up for success in the presidential election and setting us up for success is really important to me to have a campaign that really focused on young voters such as myself um, to understand what we're voting on because even as somebody who I've had the time, space, and privilege of being extremely informed and the environments to be surrounded by mentors who constantly pour into me, I was still confused by the process. And so it's really a matter of being able to share the privileges that I had of these great speakers who broke down what it means to be a voter, what it means to be active. Um, and it was really just a, a special opportunity to be in relationship with people to prove that civic engagement is something that happens on a daily basis. I'd actually love to take this opportunity to share an extraordinary insight that was shared with me a couple of years ago. Um, I got into a conversation with a woman from the League of Women Voters who had been sitting outside my public library for months registering people of all ages to vote. And she told me that from her months of conversations with new voters, she had gained this extraordinary insight, which is that for a lot of voters, voting feels like taking a test. And because it feels like taking a test, it, first of all, it feels scary and unpleasant. Did my mic just go out? No, there, there we go. It feels scary and unpleasant, but also it um, short circuits certain kinds of common sense, such as the fact that you are allowed to bring somebody with you into the voting booth, that you are allowed to write down who you intend to vote for, because those things would not be permitted with a test. And when she said that, I thought, this has such implications for the educational system when we have an educational system that is increasingly emphasizing high, um, high stakes tests, tests which are extremely racialized and that have very different, ex uh, that uh, are experienced very differently by people of different races and classes. So I just wanted to take this moment to share that insight that was given to me by this woman from the League of Women Voters. So now I wanna come back to the two of you. Um, we had a pre-conversation to, um, a, a a couple of days ago, the three of us spoke on the phone to come up with some of what we might like to talk about during this session. And one of the themes that came out really strongly was the theme of adultification. Naomi, you were the one who brought up this idea of adultification, and uh, Dean Gay spoke about it a little bit as well. So I'm wondering if you could tell people what that term means, because some people might not have encountered the term adultification before, and if you could speak a little bit about how adultification has affected your activism and how it's affected you. So adultification of black girls is, well, first of all, studies show that black girls are seen as adults at the age of five. Um, and, <laughs> um, 
And so they're just, they're disciplined more harshly and they're seen as less innocent and people, they're expected to act as adults, but even though they're children. And um, I don't think that it's really affected um, my platform, mm -hmm. um, but I am aware that it is a very real thing and I like to talk about it and raise awareness about it because it's just not okay. Mm -hmm. Because you can be um, a five-year-old girl and be so confused as to why when your white classmate starts crying, they get comforted, but then when you start crying, you are told to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you felt um, the effects of adultification at all in the way that the media has treated you? I'm actually not sure. Um, I don't really pay attention, a lot of attention to that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's probably a good choice. Mm -hmm. How about you? Have you felt that this has been a factor in your activism? Most definitely. Um, I think partially because uh, a factor of adultifying somebody, the, the, the problem that I find with it, there are many problems, but the problem that I find with it is that there's a temporariness to being an adult. And so you are placed in the category of adulthood when it's convenient and then quickly taken out of it when you are then put in position to defend yourself. And so it is no longer a conversation happening amongst peers, but it's a conversation in which somebody is given the power to reinstate the hierarchy when necessary. And you see this when you look at the, the as we've discussed before, but the killing of black boys and black girls. And when it turns to our ability to then stand up for ourselves, we're not given the same right. And then on a much smaller scale of being from the, the liberal bubble of California, of LA, it's been interesting um, as of late to even see how I'm perceived, and I think we had talked about this previously, in that a lot of the articles that have come out as of late have made the point of asking whether how I speak is premeditated, mm -hmm. um, pre-planned, politician-like. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting because these are things that range from Time Magazine to Cosmo. And I didn't realize how, um, how concerned they were with whether or not I was being authentic because I didn't match whatever their, their preconceived notion was of childhood. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're not viewing me as an adult either. And so I think the paradox of where I stand in their eyes was something that has been uh, something that I've paid extra attention to and I'm grateful to be able to have parents on this journey who have been there every step of the way with me because they have intentionally maintained my childhood, especially in an industry which has systematically said by the age of 16, you should be able to represent yourself on set. You should be able to, and you've not been given the equipment to do that. And as much as this is something that happens within the industry of entertainment, it's something that happens on a regular basis. Something that happens in schools, when you look at the criminalization of our hair and how those conversations go, when you look at strip searches performed on students, mm -hmm. how does that happen? Mm -hmm. It is because you've adultified them and then when it comes time to actually be in conversation, you've no longer given them the freedom or the rights to stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yara yeah. reminded me of something. Um, she talked, you talked about um, being put in a place of adulthood when it's convenient for people. Um, and I can relate to that because people, when I'm on stage, often people will treat me as adult, as an adult, and they will um, just, they won't treat me as a child, but then the second that we walk off stage, they won't include me in the conversations about the next steps, and they... <laughs> mm -hmm. So what, they don't include you in conversations about next steps. What is a time when you had ideas about next steps that then got cut off? This is a good moment to share some ideas about next, next steps, specifically about gun violence or about something else? Um, I was at an event and I was off stage. I had just given a speech and they were talking about, um, I, don't, I don't even know because they just, they were in like a circle and they weren't like letting me in. Mm. And it was, but when I was on stage, they were praising me and they were telling me how smart I was mm -hmm. and they were treating me like I was older than I am. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we walked off stage, it's like I wasn't even there. Wow. Wow. Did you want to follow up on that at all? Or? Um. I remember having an interesting experience in which we were at um, a shoot, a photo shoot, and they were talking about 
inclusion in television, gender inclusion in television, and it's fascinating the positioning of gender to erase all of other categories of identity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were at this shoot talking about women in television, and I had made a point of reaching out beforehand to s ask who they're including. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a particular place in which we're really fortunate to have many people on television that reflect many other people. And they were like, oh no, it'll be great, it'll be diverse. Mm -hmm. I get there, and somehow they've, and mind you, these are all incredible actresses, somehow they found three actresses that look like triplets. <laughs> and so I'm there, they, they, I think they put me in the back of the photo because my hair was big. Um, <laughs> small things. But um, then they wanted to have a round table in which we discussed inclusion. And I, being sick of being the representative of, because inherently I think it's unfair to people that I'm representing for me to be the face of, when I know I'm doing an inadequate job of representing all struggles and the intention of me saying why are there more people in the room of different backgrounds is because me explaining, as much as I, I deeply try and educate myself to be as inclu inclusive as possible, it'd be reductive if I was the face of every other identity you could think of, me being the face of Gen Z, of the global conversation and the black conversation and the female conversation all in one. And so I had asked politely to just not participate. Mm -hmm. And the, the editor of the magazine came up to me and was like, well, tell me why. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I told you why. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, then don't you think it'd be a great opportunity to explain like what your problem is on screen? Like, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what was, and, and not to go like play by play, but what was fascinating was in this moment, we are in a circle, and this grown woman, you see my publicist, you see my mother, right? They've made themselves apparent, they've been involved in the conversation. She's addressing me, but she's not hearing me. And she keeps doing the same thing. She keeps addressing me, asking me why I do not want to participate and how unfair it is. And she says, well, I understand inclusion. I worked at the Washington Post. I said, great for you. But she's, again, not hearing the conversation. She's not giving me the privilege of then saying, hear my no. Mm -hmm. And a part of this conversation around inclusion is hearing my voice, including my voice in your process. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was just a minor example. And Given has very little um, kind of symptoms or any, any problem in the world, but it was fascinating in that moment to really see how that's highlighted within liberal structures. And we have an ongoing conversation about how neoliberalism is a perpetuator of these problems. Naomi, how do you think... Oh. <laughs> Naomi, how do you think the voices of black girls could be amplified better? people could recognize their struggles. And I think that a big part of the problem is that you have a lot of older white people saying that they understand, mm -hmm. and they don't understand, and they need to take the time to learn mm -hmm. and n acknowledge that they will never fully understand, but that they can try and help. Mm -hmm. And that even without that, they they can, even without the full knowledge, they can listen, mm -hmm. and they can hear, mm -hmm. and they can, um, recognize that they could do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So I want to bring the conversation to the theme of the arts and vision and justice. Um, in an er earlier today, Theaster Gates said something extraordinary. He said many extraordinary things, but one of the things that um, stuck out for me the most. He said, have we created spaces where young people can be just? And I'd like to expand the, that, that idea from uh, physical spaces to arts more generally. So you are both people who are um, living lives in search of justice. You are both justice seekers. And my question is, what arts, what, it could be what physical spaces, what architectural spaces, but what arts more broadly have enabled you to be just, to seek justice? Um, well, I'd have to start by saying the art of education, if that counts, in that um, my parents really created a supplementary curricula for me mm -hmm. when I was growing up. I didn't watch TV or movies um, except for like 
an hour on the weekends. And so the TV was off Monday through Friday. And instead, we were given audiobooks and books. And um, they told me I was, there was one moment in which I was doing a distance learning program. And I was so interested in history that I'd finished all the courses a month early. And so they gave me the next set of courses in which they were talking about African history, which we were talking about Iranian history. My folklore books, not only did I have the real Grimm's fairy tale in second grade, which I, I think much to the dismay of my classmates when I told them how the fairy tales actually ended. <laughs> but uh, um, when I look at even Cinderella, something as iconic as that figure of what a princess is, the Cinderellas that I had were the Egyptian Cinderella, the Korean Cinderella, the Persian Cinderella. They found these stories, the global narrative, basically. And the other aspect of it was the fact that I had the privilege of having family in the arts. Um, I have an uncle who's a jazz musician, a cousin who's a rapper, and he's the one who, not only through his art, but through extending to me, he's the one who introduced me to James Baldwin. And he's the person um, that put me in environments in which I could see and hear about other artists. And so even in school is where I learned about much of the art that I think has really impacted me. I went to an all-girls Catholic school, but the first essay that we had to write on was on August Wilson, Wilson the piano lessons, and then the next was um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And then we went through Sandra Cisneros, and it was interesting to be in an environment in which our stories were centered, in which this was not a class on African American or ethnic voices in, but this was our English class. And the idea of being central um, to, our, uh, to my own narrative, I think is what made arts really expansive for me and the fact that I was able to really select what I was viewing had made, given me the opportunity to understand the, the quote unquote American dream through a context that made more sense to me. And I think to quote James Baldwin as I always do, it would, the one thing he said in a conversation directly discussing the American dream is he says, by the age of five or six or seven, I'm loosely paraphrasing, um, but by the age of five or six or seven, every stick and stone you've seen is white, and so you assume you are too. And it comes as a great shock when you realize that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians while you were rooting for Gary Cooper, you are the Indians. It comes as a great shock when the, pl the flag that you pledged allegiance to, along with everybody else, did not pledge allegiance to you. And the reason I bring that up is because I think arts have been a form of reclaiming um, my allegiance to, to a community that considers me, mm -hmm. to a community that is constantly in consideration of others, rather than to an idea of nationalism. And media has everything to do with how we understand nationalism. Mm -hmm. And as of right now, we think nationalism is the Seinfeld show and Friends. And as much as I assume that those are fantastic shows, that is not a, something that includes me. Mm -hmm. Naomi? I went to the African American History Museum, um, and it was just such, there are six floors of black history, and it was just so cool. Um, I was pretty young, not that young, and I'm still 12 though. Um, and it was just such a liberating experience because there were floors on scientists, and there were on black scientists, and there were floors on black entertainers, and there was just such a variety of black figures. Um, and it wasn't just overwhelmingly well-known black figures. It was black fi figures that people didn't really know about. And there were red box parts of the museum where it was graphic, but it still told those stories. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really amazing. Mm -hmm. What about in your school? What kinds, of, uh, what kinds of, of arts were you exposed to in your school or in your home, in your family, that have been able Seek justice. My history teacher, um, he's here with me today. Um, the um, first week of school, he showed us a picture of uh, this, or the painting of the signing of the Declaration, no, the Constitution, the signing of the Constitution. And he said, what do you see and what do you not see? And we said, well, we see a bunch of old white straight men, but we don't see a whole lot of diversity. Um, and that was just so helpful because I went to an old school where we learned a little bit about Martin Luther King, but we didn't learn about any black scientists and we didn't learn about slavery. Um, we learned about like Thomas Edison or something. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> 
And so going to a new, um, pretty diverse school where my history teacher is just so aware and where he can ask us what we see and what we don't see, um, that really inspired me. You look like you want to follow up on, on what Naomi said. Do you want to? Mm -hmm. No, you put it really perfectly. <laughs> um, but I, I similarly had an ex same experience at the museum, and I remember coming out of the Emmett Till Memorial and being so moved. Um, but I think what I loved most was that it was a communal experience. And, you know, I've always experienced, I've been really grateful to... Um, have a curricula in which it is a globalist perspective, but usually that's something that I individually received, and so to be in a space in which we were in community experiencing that was really special, and it speaks to just the power of, again, forms and infrastructures as the panel before I discussed, because I remember, and this was something we had even discussed, one of my pet peeves is the separation of Egypt from Africa, particularly in museum spaces. Um, in that, I remember going to the British Museum, and it was, it was quite hilarious, actually, because uh, you go in, and they have the Rosetta Stone, which is pretty epic, and you move into the e Egypt exhibit in which they have all of these artifacts, and one of the artifacts said this is an Egyptian talking to an African. And then you have to go through um, the Americas, down the stairs, around the corner, open the door, and there's the Africa exhibit. And everything they had in there was post-colonial. And so what was fascinating was, one, there's no acknowledgement of that. So the only reason I was aware of that is because I was aware of when Africa was colonized and by whom. And so you're in these spaces, and it, there was such a, a dearth of artifacts to pull from that they even had to... Um, reach out and um, pay for some artists to contribute artifacts. But it meant that there was no explanation as to why you're not seeing the beauty or celebration of Africa, because at this point, the rubber's in Belgium and there's been a genocide. At this point, the bronze from Benin is elsewhere. You can look in the Greece exhibit, or you can look in France or look in uh, the England exhibit, and that's where you're gonna see all of these African resources, but there's no acknowledgement of that. And so when you look at how our basic visual structures play into this idea of, um, inequality by exactly the point you were making by what they're not telling us and what we're not seeing, there in that moment you realize that we are okay separating, Af uh, separating Egypt and celebrating it, but there's been a systematic s separation from its blackness. And so these accomplishments have not been viewed as something that has been contributory or contributed by black people in any way. And they've been almost raceless. And so then when you look at Africa as a whole, there is no conversation around how integral it's been to the rest of the world dialogue. Mm -hmm. One theme that's coming out for me really strongly in this conversation is the importance of education and how education happens in so many different places. It happens in museums, it happens in families, it happens in schools, primary, secondary, um, and one place that education, of course, happens is also in the media. And you are both people who have been educators through media. So um, I'm just very curious about what it is like for you to know that you have been role models for other black girls. You have been for many other children. You have been um, people who, have, who they have looked to. Um, and have been inspired by. So I'm curious about what that experience has, has been like for you, Naomi. It's been pretty amazing, but part of my own platform is not just taking all of the credit for myself. I really want to tell the stories of black girls, but I also want to hand them the mic and let them tell their own stories because I don't want, Yes, I can represent them, but I don't know what it's like to be them. I mean, I am a black girl, but I don't know every one of their stories. Yeah. 
honestly perfectly put and just building off of that, I'm extremely grateful for the support that I've gotten just in um, what I do on television and outside of it. And I'm aware of the role that characters play, that blackish plays, that grownish plays in telling a narrative that is inclusionary or inclusive of us. But the one thing that it's really emphasized to me is again, what we don't see and understanding the importance of infrastructure. Being on a show like blackish and being on a show like grownish, I think um, what I've um, been most grateful for is the fact that we've been able to introduce new directors into network television, introduce new writers into network television, because it's breaking that cycle of not being given an opportunity because you don't have the resume, but not being given the opportunity to ever build the resume. And the one thing that the creator of both shows, Kenya Barris, has done is said that it's not a risk to believe in people. And so he has been able to push people into the system of being able to have a black female director on set is something that I'm grateful to have that experience. To be able to have different identities um, help form these shows has been so integral and goes to your point of passing over the mic because the goal of a show like Blackish or Grownish or even having started our own production company and what we're doing is this idea of allowing people to tell their own stories and allowing people the platform and um, the background and the resources and support to go tell their own stories. And so it is more so this idea of everything you're doing with the intention of opening the door for other people, because if it stops where you are, then that's where the progress stops as well. Thank you. So one thing we talked about in our pre-conversation was giving you two the opportunity to ask each other questions. So Yara, I was wondering if you could ask Naomi what you would like to ask her. My question's really simple, but I'd love to know what gives you hope? You have been in environments in which you've been an advocate talking about so many atrocities in the world, and so I was wondering what really inspires you or makes you happy. It really inspires me when I see people caring about what's going on in the world and educating themselves on what's going on in the world because if you, a big part of the problem is it's not that people don't care, it's that they don't know and it's just ignorance. And so when I see people who are taking the time to learn more about the terrible things that are happening but also still having, being optimistic for what they can do and for what others can do and for what the world could do and recognizing that they can't just hand the mic over to somebody else. It's everybody's responsibility to make the world a better place. So the question I was gonna ask you was already asked. So I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I have to think of a new one now. We can come back to it. Okay. okay. We can come back to it. Um, we've been talking a lot about black girls because that's your subjectivity, and I have been curious as to whether you have thoughts about representations, visual representations of black boys. Um, what are your observations about visual representations of black boys, and what are your thoughts about that? I don't think you can't not think about it. Um, and I know oftentimes people justify their thought by saying, well, as somebody who has a brother as somebody who is a father. But I, I think even if you had no connection, it should be important to think about. And with that being said, I have two brothers. <laughs> and um, it's interesting, again, growing up in an environment in which my parents have very intentionally placed us in inclusive spaces. And at the same time, it's been a balance of understanding that we live in um, in a a much more inclusive space in the rest of the world while not ignoring the fact that this is not our reality mm -hmm. and that this is not everyone's reality. And so when you're thinking about portrayals of, of black boys, it again goes back to this dehumanization that occurs on um, such an integral level. I remember even one time my brothers were at school and um, my one brother was picking up the other brother they're 16 and 11. And at the time, this was about a year ago, they went to hug each other and the teacher told them not to hug. Um, and I, I get that different schools have different policies, but there's a moment in which that occurs in which you're not viewing these as two humans with a connection to each other. You're not viewing them as, as two children who are happy to see each other, and it's a denial of joy. And so it's been about how do you reinstate the narrative around joy, whether it's 
every, I think you, everyone's seen the hashtag black boy joy. How do you reinstate narratives surrounding just the everydayness of us rather than these uh, moments that we see in the media? And again, how do we r turn that narrative around? Because when we talk about Tamir Rice, which is something that um, makes me really emotional every time we talk about it, but I see that and I'm like, how dare you kill my brother? You see the murder of Nipsey Hussle, and it's like, how dare you kill my prophets? And it has everything to do with how we feel placed in this world, and to see other people's lack of care is um, world-shifting, but it's also very inspirational because it, it reminds me of why we do this work and why you have to advocate for something more than yourself. And when we talk about black womanhood, and we were actually recently having a conversation about black feminism, but so many times we think that it is just a conversation on black womanhood in specific, but it's, it is really a conversation around centering black women, but in inclusion of black women, you have to understand that we automatically care and have considered the intersections of other identities. And we're considering the intersection of immigration, we're considering the intersection of um, what it means to be first generation, what it means to be LGBTQ, plus what it means to be in these other spaces because we automatically hit those intersections and have people that we care about in those intersections as well. And so to, to focus or center on black womanhood and black boyhood is not a selfish act, but rather this idea of expansively caring about everybody. Somebody asked me at school um, if I thought it was worse to be a black woman than a black man. And I said that we have, both of them have issues, and it's not about which one is worse. It's about, because comparing gets us nowhere. It's about how black women and black men can work together and lift each other up. Yeah. Have you thought of a question that you might like to ask Yara? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you can pass. Yeah, I think, um, so you are a role model for a lot of young girls, and I wanted to know how you balance your public life with your personal life. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm still figuring it out on a daily basis, but again, going back to why I'm so grateful to have my parents with me every step of the way, they really um, have been there to help me just figure out what brings me joy. And I realize that oftentimes it's not about finding the separate work-life balance, but figuring out where they meet. And as long as whatever I'm doing is purpose-driven, I'm extremely happy. And so it, it's really been um, about like investing in and pouring into 18 by 18 to figure out what the next iteration of that is. It's been reading a lot of books. I love I love reading, love listening to podcasts. Um, I think I single-handedly support NPR <laughs> because it's all, all I do. But it's been about finding those personal moments of growth and finding spaces, whether it's this one, which I'm so grateful to be in, or whether it's the Underground Museum in Los Angeles, which if you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go. Um, but just finding spaces in which I'm investing in myself and my own education and expanding because I think it's automatically what really motivates me to then go back out into the world and do whatever work needs to be done. I'd like to know if um, you have advice for other, p other young activists or people who are perhaps not activists who would like to become activists, um, or advice for adults who would like to support young activists as they work towards justice? Um, I often like to say that success looks like you. Um, many people, when they're starting out, they want to speak out. They want to. They want to do almost anything. They just. They look at other people and they compare themselves to other people, and they say that is what success looks like. So I need to do blank to um, be successful. And so I think that it's really about knowing that. Whatever you do makes you successful. If you want to be an activist and you want to put up posters around your school, that's being successful. And if you want to make speeches, that's being successful. If you want to post a video on YouTube of you singing, that's successful. Because whatever you want to do, however far you get, it's, that's successful. Yeah, and 
I think to your point, we're in a day and age in which you can quantify almost anything. Um, because of social media, you can quantify, I can physically look at my analytics and see how many people I've reached. And, and that can be really dangerous in that we try and quantify our impact or find something that is as tangible as possible, in which that's counterintuitive to how inspiration and how inspiring others actually works. Um, and so I'd have to agree with everything that you've said. And then also just add finding a support network. I'm, extremely grateful to be in a position to have so many mentors, so many of which are in this room, so many people that I pull inspiration from, so many people that I leave feeling inspired and full, and so many people that I can even process with. And it's been about finding intergenerational support and realizing that it's not about recreating the wheel either. You contribute how you can, but I think like the one, the one tattoo I have on my body is the apostrophe 63 for 1963. And it's a reminder of the work that was done in that year. It's a reminder of what's occurred. And even though it's only one year and one of many that's contributed to the freedoms that I experience now, it has everything to do with the work that I do. It's the year that The Fire Next Time came out. It was the bombing of the Birmingham church. It was the death of Medgar Evers. And it was the March on Washington. And so being in conversations with generations before and after you, I think is extremely crucial because I think, again, it goes so many times as this generation, we think that we are doing this by ourselves when there have been so many people who have invested in humans that they don't even know. And that's a really powerful act. And I think recognizing that really is um, comforting. Thank you. I'd like to know about something that you've never seen. This is something we talked about before. Something that you've never seen, either in representation or in reality, that you really want to see. This is really a question about what are you visually hungry for? What do you literally want to see? Um, I looked at the editorial board of the New York Times, and it was, <laughs> it was very white and male, and um, I want to see a black woman, preferably myself, running the New York Times. Um, I'm gonna preface this by saying when I was 13, my favorite book was Catcher in the Rye, much to my dismay now <laughs> when I look back. Um, but what it, it really struck in me is just my familiarity with mainstream culture in which there's been no familiarness with myself. And so the one thing that I always say is like, when you see a person of color and, and somebody in many intersections in a role like Holden Caulfield, in which we are watching them for two hours do nothing in particular, <laughs> and we're okay with that and we're invested, I think that will demonstrate another level of investment. I mean, <laughs> like if you think about, a movie like Boyhood, I, I think it, it marks our, our, our general investment in that type of being and the fact that I can watch you do nothing but just exist. And so many times narratives, and we've talked about the confines of being an artist of color, but so many times it has to be about something. And um, I don't think we'll ever escape it having to be about something because that's just um, a side effect of us existing in these bodies. But I think if you can have a narrative in which you're just allowed to exist on screen and people are invested in that, that's gonna mean a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So my very last question for you. Um, I would like, we have a, a, an extraordinary audience here, um, both the people in this room and also everybody who is watching online. This is a, a particular audience that has never existed before today, this particular convening. And so what I would like to know is, what do you want this audience to know about black girls and vision and justice? I want everybody in this room um, to view black girls with the same potential as anybody else. I wanna just say thank you to everybody in this room because you all do such amazing work um, that contributes to the space that we get to reside in and play in. Um, and so I'm really grateful for you all. But the other thing I guess I'd have to say is 
you know, we rise together. And, and when you look at anybody's narrative expanding um, any intersection, any ethnicity, any sexuality, any gender, um, that when you look at that person, you just remind yourself of who are we if not each other and to carry that with you as you interact with everybody. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.